Well, I call the meeting to order. Um, can we have a roll call? Sure. Ann Harrigan. Tony Perigini. Here. Faith Pam. Here. You have a form. Great. Let's. Let's Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Open with public comment. Do we have any? No. Okay. Um, first order of business is a review of the minutes um, from our April 18th, 2022. Um, so you have, I assume we've had a chance to review, but you were not present, so... Okay. Um, I didn't see any changes. Yeah, they looked good. So do I have a motion to approve? Madam Chair, Okay, and I'll second them. So all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, so then, um, the minutes are approved. All right, so we're moving on to item three, informational items. Um, we're going to start with um, the World Language Cheshire Curriculum Re uh, Council Review. Before we do, I just want to make note that we will be tabling um, item C, SAT results overview because our presenter, Dr. Gad, is not with us tonight. So we will take those up in June. All right. Take it away, team. Awesome. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being Thank here. Thank you for being here. Can I go ahead? Okay. Yeah, this, I just was going to welcome you all and just yeah. highlight yeah. that this is part of the five-year curriculum review process that I know we've all become very familiar with mm -hmm. now. And as part of that process, we always ask the subcommittee to come and give the board members an executive summary and overview of the program that was submitted for our curriculum council review. I want to give a special shout out to this group because this happened to be on a very stressful day when we had a early dismissal due to snow. And so we were scrambling to make sure that everyone could get here and um, the presentation was excellent, and, and it went into part of the afternoon when really schedules were, ju were juggled, and there were, um, you know, people worried about kids getting on buses and, mm -hmm. and parenting issues that everyone has on, a, on an early dismissal day. And it was really wonderful and um, got a lot of good feedback from our committee. So thank you very much for all your flexibility in getting here on that day. Well, we may need it again today because I think it's going to snow. Is it about you guys? I mean, it's just like you want to talk. No, I don't know. But anyway, we are, we are pleased to be here. My name is Arturo Brunk. I'm the department chair for World Languages, and I have you with me, my colleagues that I'll introduce to you uh, soon. Uh, so today, we are, as you can see, the date uh, there is March 9th. That was the date of our presentation. We have chosen to use the same PowerPoint presentation, but we will give you the uh, exec executive uh, summary we will point out the major aspects of our presentation. Um, we were supposed to be a bigger team, you know, we, we believe in strength in numbers. Uh, unfortunately, two of our colleagues due to health issues and, and family issues could not be here with us tonight. But we have a great team that will be able to uh, present that section of the PowerPoint. So, so uh, let me introduce, actually, why don't you introduce yourself to be much easier. Uh, go ahead. Katie Abrazzi, Latin at high school. Yeah. Kristen Haza, German at high school. Tina O'Connor, French at high school. Yeah, so not with us uh, uh, today. We have uh, uh, Liliana Lopes, which is one of our teachers of Spanish uh, at the high school. And we don't have uh, Krista Kofanovic, a teacher of French at the middle school and high school. Unfortunately, they couldn't be here. Um, so going along, moving along with the presentation, um, we had a chance uh, through this uh, five-year review to kind of look at everything that we do. Um, uh, we had a chance to look even at our mission statement and our vision, and uh, had a chance to kind of tweak it a little bit as well. Um, you know, just about everything that we do on in our department, we are f uh, firm believers that um, you know things should not be written in stone. You know, that's how you get better by improving. And so we looked at this, we changed a few things, and uh, just going over that very quickly. Um, you know, when it looks at our mission, our program looks to promote uh, linguistic and cultural proficiency and literacy. Um, 
while at the same time cultivating a lifelong appreciation for the study of languages. We want our kids to enjoy the learning process. Um, obviously, this is important because we'll allow them to really be an active members of our global uh, society that we have in such a small world nowadays. So hopefully all this language uh, proficiency uh, along with cultural proficiency, which is also equally important, uh, will be able to uh, be, have them be a positive members of our, of our world uh, nowadays. We look to achieve that through, um, through the use of uh, authentic materials. Uh, we're all about the usage of real life application. Uh, we look to expose them to what is current materials, everything that, that we can find. Um, hopefully that will uh, uh, make the learning process a little bit more enjoyable uh, for them as well. Um, and uh, uh, more rewarding as well. Um, we also uh, allow, you know, in order to achieve our mission, we also um, expose them to exchange programs, those students that want to. Uh, that uh, reinforces uh, a lot of the stuff that we do in the classroom. Uh, we also have advanced placement and ECE courses that allows them to even further their uh, uh, study of the language and obviously proficiency level. Um, and once again, um, we want them to be very uh, embracing uh, not only the language but the culture. Uh, that will make them uh, part of this uh, multilingual global citizens. This is uh, currently this is our program uh, that starts in sixth grade. Unfortunately, it's not a K through twelve; it's a six through twelve. Um, I'm hoping to. Uh, with your help down the road to be able to expand that to our lower grades. Um, so we started sixth grade with Spanish, which is the only language offered. When our students enter to the middle school in seventh grade, they have an, uh, a chance to switch a language, choose a different language if they want to. Um, at that time, we have Spanish, German, French, and Latin. Uh, whatever the language they choose in seventh grade, they stay with that language for eighth grade. At the end of eighth grade, they'll come to the high school in ninth grade which will allow them, once again, they'll have the chance to either switch languages, add another language, um, or continue the language that they were studying uh, at that. Um, we also have an additional uh, language at the high school, which is Italian. So aside from the four that, they, that we offer at the middle school, the Spanish, German, French, and Latin, we also have the Italian. And obviously, they can study a language all the way through 12th uh, grade. I just want to show you a, a quick video, and I'm not going to play the whole video, uh, only parts of it. Personal digital animal. Roger, your sir, sir. Before I can help you, could you please spell your name for me, sir? T. Ash. E. E. Is that an O, sir? Yes. E. R. One more R. Y. That is not a letter, sir. Is the letter Y. <laughs> Can I just call you Greg, sir? <laughs> I'm Thierry. Thierry. Bien sûr, monsieur. How can I help you today, Mr. Greg? I try to start my air a bit, it doesn't work. I'm very tired. So I'll stop here. The reason why I wanted to show you this video is that obviously the gentleman on the video, he is proficient in the language. However, he's, 
he does have difficulty with pronunciation. Most likely he's a learner that study that started to learn the language at a, at a later stage in his life, and that's why he never was able to achieve that native-like pronunciation. Uh, that's one of the things that I need your help. That's why we need to kind of, in, in the Czech public school system, we really need to try to promote languages that are at a much younger age. I think the younger we reach our students, the more proficient they will be down the road, and the better they will be understood as they go into their, uh, with their lives down, uh, down the road. So this is a good example that how important it is to start to start the learning a language at a very young uh, uh, young age. Um, we're going to continue with the presentation, and uh, I'll have uh, uh, Madame Ocon. Um, she'll be telling talking to you about curriculum. All right. You don't have to call me Madame. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's great. It's great. Oh, so it's force of habit. Yes. Um, so, it is my pleasure to talk to you about curriculum because it is truly an aspect of teaching in our department and of my personal and professional life that I feel exceptionally strongly about. And it's something that I think our department does exceptionally well. So it brings me a great amount of pleasure and pride to share it with you. When we talk about curriculum in world language, it isn't just an abstract idea. It is the skeleton of everything we do. And it is no more haphazard than the human skeleton. Every single piece fits together for a reason. And it may not be something you've ever considered, but communication is at the core of our curriculum because that's really what we're teaching everyone to do, regardless of language. We are teaching them to be effective communicators. But our professional organization has broken down everything that we do into what we call the five C's. So communication is at the heart of it, but we also touch on communities, comparisons, connections, and cultures. Culture is the foundation of everything we do because you can't teach a language as an isolated topic. It, it is part and parcel to the culture from which it originates and in which it continues to thrive and change. But along the way, what we hope to do is encourage students to draw comparisons between their native language and their new language or languages, draw comparisons between their, their mother culture and other cultures, make connections therein as well. And if we're lucky, um, we have a little bit of a, an easier time with Spanish than the other languages, but we hope to reach out into the real world communities so that it isn't something they think they're doing in isolation either. We want them to feel that they are engaged and are engaging the world. When we come back to communication, there are three main forms of it, interpretive, presentational, and interpersonal. This is a way for us to sort of qualify and quantify the different activities that we do. Interpretive is when they are receiving input. They're listening, they're viewing, they're reading, Right, so it's all in. Presentational is when it's all out. They are speaking or writing and showing us that they can create the language. And interpersonal is when they are doing both things at the same time in uh, organic conversation. How do we get them there? We tend to focus on what we call the four skills, reading, writing, speaking, listening. And across the board, meaning across all of our languages, although Latin does less out loud speaking um, in that language, they do lots of speaking with each other in class. It is a very engaging topic. I hear them, um, so I can attest to the fun that they have. Um, but reading, writing, speaking, listening, German does, French does, Spanish does, we all do. And what I love to talk about in terms of curriculum and why I think our department does it so exceptionally well is that even though we represent a host of languages, we all work as one unit. I have been with the department for 16 years now and I can truly say that to a certain extent the language that we teach doesn't matter because we all treat each other as equals and colleagues. Now that especially the three and four of us here are doing so much of our work directly online, it's really easy to share with each other everything that we do. And just about every day that we are in the office together, it's, oh, 
I heard that you were working on that project. Could you please share that with me? I want to adapt that to my class. Or could you please help me figure out this thing? I can't quite find the right piece to get the twos to work on this piece of grammar. And, and so we brainstorm together. And as Mr. Bronco was saying, everything that we do is a living, breathing document. All of us use our curriculum every single day. That is not an exaggeration. It is not a document that sits in a shelf in a closet somewhere. We live it, breathe it, sleep it, sometimes don't sleep it. Like we are all brainstorming all the time. How can we make this a real life authentic experience for our students? And when we come up with new ideas, we share them. We go right to our curricular documents, add things, subtract things, make changes. And in these last couple of years, dealing with COVID and new schedules, we had to adapt a lot, a lot, a lot. And so having a living, breathing curricular document that we touch often made that adaptation a little bit easier because we are used to doing that. And we didn't mind making those changes. I mean, aside from the horrifying circumstances of the pandemic, you know, we, we, we decided to roll with it, and that's what we do. Do we have another? Yeah, I'm going to go to okay. uh, the commendations. The commendations, I think, are kind of um, redundant because between students, families, and we teachers ourselves. Everybody was pretty much on board with being able to recognize the strengths that we have because it really is, it's very transparent. It's what we do all the time. So we agree that we use the current curriculum guides. We do, we really do. It's not me trying to sell you something. <laughs> and we are all very much planners. We all like to have a structure. Some of us adapt more on a daily basis, but there is a core that we stick to because we are committed to making kids as fluent as they can be, as communicative as they can be, as successful as they can be. And if we don't have a game plan, we're not going to get there as successfully. Um, some of the things that we would like to have happen. PD time concentrated exclusively for teacher-directed collab and curriculum revision. That is because, and I would like to uh, give proper homage to her name for this one. Um, some of us did the five-day seminar last summer, and I cannot tell you enough how much of a difference that time makes. When we have PD time during the school year, sometimes it's an hour, sometimes it's two hours, and for those of us who are singleton teachers, meaning we're at the high school in our languages alone, we can get stuff done. But whenever a team of teachers has to work together, that hour is eaten up almost entirely by, what were we working on last time? If you work on that, I'll have to work on this. And it isn't for lack of desire to get it done. It's just that when weeks elapse between those times together, it's very hard to maintain the momentum for getting started much less for finishing something. So when we have a full day PD at school, that's awesome because we can lay forth, lay out a task, set forth on the plan to get there, and more times than not get something concrete done. But when it's five days, the amount of work and the quality of that work that can be accomplished because you start at the beginning of the week, you make your goals, you make your plan, and there's nothing interfering with getting that done. And you can collaborate while you're so that would be a huge bonus for us. We would love, as Mr. Bronco was talking about earlier, to get the kids up and running much earlier. There's a lot of brain science to support that. If they can start before age eight in particular, their ears attune to the native sounds of the language, and they aren't up against middle school judgmental emotional stuff, so there's lots of reasons for us to get them starting sooner, but also working more consistently. Core academic team, our middle school counterparts work their butts off to try to get those kids to learn what they need to learn, but also to believe in what we do. Because if they aren't part of English, math, science, history, kids at that age tend to think it's more of just a fun filler, and we really aren't. We are. A we are part of the, the academic base, and it would be great if we could add that 
um, to the structure at Dodd. Dodd would also benefit from having access to a language lab, even if it is just vir virtual. Ours at the high school is a, a full-on language lab, but they need something to help get them to all of these other goals. We've said this a number of times. It's crucial. CP level classes in high school. Right now, we currently offer CP in Spanish, but there are students in Latin and German and Italian and French who really struggle to keep up with the CCP pace and who don't want to switch to Spanish because they love the language that they're in, but academically, sometimes it is prohibitive. So if we were able to expand everything on our wish list, that would be part of the wish list. When we have more time in PD, we can embed more performance-based assessments in what we do. We try to have one in every curricular unit that we have across all the languages, but they need time to be developed. And even if we have some, we could always benefit from more time to revise them based on how well they've worked or not and what you know, new uh, elements we need to include. And um, we are constantly trying to update cultural components. As Mr. Brunker was saying, we want it to be authentic. We want it to be up to date. We need time to research YouTube. We need time to get in touch with our uh, exchange program colleagues. So time is really of the essence in our ability to implement manifest, revise, you know, we're, a lot of us in the department are perfectionists for better or for worse, and time is the only thing standing in our way. But the intention is there, the on the ground hard work is there, and I'm really proud of all of my colleagues and everything we do. Thank you, And I'll bring Magistra uh, Obrowski now to kind of share with you all the work that's done and the resources and technology. All right, so. Um, big thing here, uh, I mean, COVID was actually quite a help for resource and technology because we really had to go outside of a lot of our comfort zones in researching different ideas and ways to keep the kids engaged and keep it authentic using different, um, different uh, platforms online or you know, um, whatever we could find to help them out. Um, so increased use of language lab, even though it kind of fell to the wayside over COVID, just for safety protocols, the kids still really do enjoy it. Parent feedback, same thing. One-to-one um, -one Chromebooks has been extremely beneficial. Um, we use a lot of authentic supplemental materials, whether it's being a YouTube video or some like a, a TV program or literally a speaker coming in. Um, I know people have used, um, uh, was it Margarita, used Skype? Correct. To actually have someone from Spain come in and speak to the class. So these things have been great, but always be cool to more. Um, on increased use of online materials, such as lots of stuff out there, which has been great. And I know for myself, GimKit is a great tool to use for vocab review, grammar review. The kids are engaged, it's a game, it's fun. Same with Kahoot. Um, they, the conjugamos for the different conjugations, and that extends beyond just Spanish. They, I know the students really enjoy using these to help not necessarily become fluent, but to give themselves a better foundation for the language, vocab review. It's quick, it's fast, it's, it's simplistic, and they don't feel, um, if they make a mistake, they don't feel bad about themselves. It's just a fun way to do it. Um, so what will be, what we are looking for is we do definitely need a review of textbooks just going on with curriculum as well, just to make sure they're updated, especially with culture. Um, I know that cult nah, Latin culture, but you know, other cultures change, um, mine's pretty set. <laughs> um, but just, you know, wherever it's current applicable. Um, the students, we want to just continue researching different platforms that will help students learn best and increase the reinforcement of instruction. Um, this, I actually really like this paper school. Um, but some students actually did want the option of not just having everything be online technology, but paper also. I know in my class, I put it up on Classroom and give everyone a hard copy as well. And, yeah, I'm not gonna lie, they generally write in the hard copy. But I have some kids who, you know, it's there if they want it. Um, 
training and support for use of technology and everything that comes out. It's obviously always at a rapid pace. Um, at least once a quarter, provide professional development for teachers to update and develop our own curriculum, not just for the content, but for things that we can embed in it using different resources and technology. Um, parents wanted more authentic audio supplemental material, which again, just as Tina said, we need time to just explore and it's, there's a lot out there and you gotta weed through the, you know, it looks like it's fun and then, uh, no. So it takes, it takes, it takes time. All right, so we'll move on uh, with Frau Hase. She will uh, share with you some information that we uh, gather during our study uh, as it relates to instruction. Right. So, um, well, we had a curriculum, we had the resources, and now instruction is what brings it all together. Okay. Yes. Um, improvement. Uh, correct. I'm gonna go back to some slides. Let me know because I. Oh, right. It's okay. No. <laughs> um, the frequent use, yes, target language, we have to do that because that's how they're going to hear it, that's how they're going to practice speaking it. Um, and more of the student-centered, hands-on activities, as they were mentioning, um, one sort of reality-based assessment per curriculum unit. That way they can actually, instead of doing a paper test, they would actually be having to speak with us, you know, ordering something at a restaurant, finding their way on a subway map, actually using those skills that they're really going to be needing. And that definitely has improved their learning. Language lab as well. Um, the instructional activities, that goes back to what Tina was saying, when we really do work as a team. I say I need something for past tense, irregular verbs, I can go to this bank and to see what my colleagues have done, and we can pull from each other. So that has been a great, great help. Um, yeah, cleaning protocol, we have that. We did that. Um, and I have to admit, the kids are loving being back in the language lab. Um, my kids like, Frau, it's a D-Day. It's our turn. Okay, I know, I know. They really, they cannot wait to get in there because they love talking. Um, cultural activities, performance-based tasks, that's it. That's really where we want to go. That's, that's life. That's how we want them to learn. Um, language workshops would be nice. Rolling review of textbooks, that's what Katie has talked about. Virtual language lab at the middle school by 2023. Not just having you know our language lab, but the middle school as well, and that goes back into having Skype. Um, I also got a partner school in Germany, and we did a little one-on-one -on -one with a classroom there. So that's where technology comes in really nicely. Explore Dodd schedule seventh grade, sure every day. That would be phenomenal. Um, one thing that was probably on a previous slide that I wanted to definitely mention about instruction though, um, was going back to the online, having been at home and having those online games, and they're, they're games, yes, but they're instructional games. The kids, um, where was that? The second bullet. The second the bullet. bullet. Practice. Yeah, it, it definitely helped in their language acquisition, but the big thing I wanted to point out was when kids learn at a different pace, um, they can go back. And they said having those resources to go back and just study it on their own has helped them catch up, perhaps, by practicing that vocab. If they want to study for a test and they're not sure, they have that all in that one spot. So that was the highlight for instruction for me that I wanted to point out. And it really instruction ties in curriculum and resources. As you can see, some of the some of the aspects mentioned in the different presentations they kind of overlap because these are uh, not only what we're talking about the accommodations and recommendations are they come straight from all the surveys we have made. Um, so just for the sake of time to give you a good gist, 
uh, these combinations really tell us what people will think about our program, uh, not only the parents, uh, teachers, students, um, so that kind of summarizes all of that. Uh, as uh, 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 Senora Lopez cannot be here today, um, you know, I asked uh, Madame Ocon to kind of jump in and uh, kind of go over the assessment for you. Um, and these are things that we all do, so we're kind of very familiar with what, what happens in the different facets of what we do in the classroom. Okay, okay. so a lot of this again has sure. already been presented. What I can tell you is that each one of us, in addition to our commitment to curriculum, our commitment to all the different means of instruction, we really really feel strongly about assessing exactly what we're teaching. So when we talk about reading, writing, speaking, listening, we are giving assessments in all of those modes. But we're also very sensitive to limiting what we are assessing to stuff that we've covered. Or if we're giving the kids a reach task, we know that it's well within their reach. Um, and I, I think that that is an area of tremendous strength for us because a lot of us ask the students regularly for their feedback on um, timing, content, nature of assessment style. We sometimes give them choices in what they are able to present as an assessment. And I think that the kids have much greater buy-in in terms of the academics, but I've also seen a great change in the social and emotional stuff by giving them the respect of including them in that decision making, it makes them feel important and it makes them more willing to work with us and for us. So assessment is not just a static, old fashioned, stodgy kind of thing. Assessment for us is constantly morphing. It includes creativity, it includes personal choice, but it also includes all of the skills. We have department rubrics that we've been using for a number of years that all of us use the same way. We may give different assignments, but we have a department rubric for essay writing. We have a department rubric for oral presentations. We have a department rubric for exam components. And it is something that we have also given lots of feedback on. We have changed over the years to roll with how students have developed and changed and, and how our emphasis on certain areas of teaching have changed. So we really do live in some of the it all the time. Language lab is used for listening and speaking assessments as well. Super awesome to be able to do that for exams. We used to have to basically interview each student individually, which took a very long time. Now we can go in the language lab within a 15 to 20 minute window. They're all speaking and recording all at once, and then we can go back and listen to them later. So that has been tremendous as well. All of our assessments aligned with the standards, which I mentioned to you at the beginning of the presentation, the five C's, the four skills, everything lines up nicey, nicey, nicey. And we even have a department template for when we come up with those shared assessments or common assessments or unit assessments. And on that template, it lists for the students all the standards that we are checking off as we give them an assignment so they understand the reasons why we're asking them to do what we're asking them to do and all the ways in which it will be beneficial for them. Uh, survey recommendations, we're going to continue doing what we do. Um, in terms of exploring the idea of changing the format of our exams to go in a more performance-based approach, uh, French has already done that. We are doing active reading, writing, speaking, listening components. Um, we're kind of the pilot team, and German is following suit, and Italian is following suit, and it's, I think, a really authentic and accurate way to be able to present to students and families, you are strong in this skill, you could improve in this skill, rather than just um, a score based on uh, you know, a tally of appropriate, but nevertheless, you know, a little bit static compared to what we are able to do now. So we have these big conversations, round table conversations with everybody in the department. We move in that direction as each language feels ready to do so when we have full buy-in. 
and I don't mind being the test subject because we get to do lots of feedback with the kids, we get to make changes, we get to report back to the rest of the department what worked, what didn't. Um, so that is my choice. I talked about this. Balancing the skills, including culture, so that when kids present to us, they are able to articulate, well, this is why I use an informal you versus a formal you. Or this is why I would have to uh, use these um, modes of courtesy. Or this is why I, you know, it's, as I said earlier, it's not, a language is not something that exists in isolation. So the cultural stuff is embedded, it is inherently embedded in everything we do because it, it cannot be extricated. So we try to make sure that, that they are articulate in that. Uh, we want to be able to reevaluate, uh, take a look at the rubrics, collect data, and collaborate. This we just do. Honestly, mornings at breakfast time, lunch time, passing in the hallway, we, we do it all the time, but it would be great to have um, more concentrated time, as we talked about earlier, so that we can use the same assessments and grade them the same way and make sure that we're supporting ourselves as well as students and all the, the standards. And uh, we'll bring back uh, Magistra to kind of uh, share with you the information regarding the professional development. I know where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> jumping in. Uh, okay. Uh, oops. Oh, sorry. All right. So, why did we serve there we go. So, basically, big thing teachers express that we would like more. Um, specific collaboration times among our languages. Uh, we need more time, and again, PD time, just to be able to revise and improve our activities and assessments. Um, time for effective planning for instruction. Um, time to search and research new authentic resources, a possible textbook series at the elementary level, and that needs time to be explored as well. Um, more training for the language lab, that would allow us to use uh, even more tools that could help enhance listening and speaking. And then different workshops that, I mean, I think most of us are well versed in the Google Classroom, hopefully. But, you know, there might be some other additions that were looked or could always be improved upon in other online activities that would just help enhance our physical classroom as opposed to just an online version. Um, so, proposed what will be, so designated time on Wednesdays at 2 to 3, 10 block to reflect on current practices and adjust instruction and curriculum as needed. Um, specific, again, on Wednesdays for sharing ideas and strategies with colleagues. Increased training on Google Apps and various language-related technologies and professional learning opportunities specific to world language, outside speakers, conferences, so on and so forth. But I really think the biggest thing here is uh, like full day PDs for our department are just crucial. I mean, you know, as as Tina and Kristen said, like we're singletons at the high school, but we have a counterpart that's at Dodd. So when we do have these meetings, you know, on Wednesdays, we're not able to actually meet with our counterpart unless like through a quick text or like quick email or call on the phone. It's, you know, it's not. We just don't have enough built in time to actually collaborate in the way that we would want to. Um, so the full day PDs are just, I mean, just designated time to just sit with our, our just, you know, our one other person and just, you know, hammer stuff out and continue with a, a really good plan that we can execute as we continue going forward. Thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, with the, with the PD, uh, also it's, we need to learn how to maximize the time that we have. That's very important too. You know, it is difficult to coordinate with other schools just because, you know, the time differences of our schedules um, on half a day are a little bit better because it gives us a little bit more time. Uh, but definitely, obviously, anyone will tell you that the full days are probably the best times that we have for, uh, for PE. Um, so, in continue with this in the closing remarks, one of the things that we state up there, we say our findings show, once again, a great deal of commonality both within and across languages. We work very hard for that, to be honest with you. Um, 
Thus, we have in place, in order to achieve that, not only we have departmental rubrics that are used across all the languages, uh, we also have templates for even our midterm exams have a format that are all identical. Um, our templates for our, our uh, assessments and templates for our um, um, uh, activities. Everything is common. Uh, definitely the word commonality is there at all times in our department. And why is that so important? Because that allows you the continuity that one needs. You know, kids need to be familiar with, when they are familiar with the expectations, what is expected of them, not only in seventh grade and twelfth grade, don't know because of the exposure that they have to all the things that we offer that are common across not only within one language but also across other languages. And that's why we talk about the uh, vertical and horizontal uh, alignment. It's not just you know to give kids, for example, in Spanish in year one the same experiences, but also ensure that all the year ones, German, French, Italian, have similar similar experiences as well. So this crosses to, into other languages. And we want to make sure that those expectations are clear. That's why kids see the same rubrics. They see the same format and everything that we do. So as they move on, they don't get like, oh my god, what is this? Nothing is new. They are familiar with it. Obviously, the expectations increase as they move along. Um, so that alignment is very, very important to us. We work really hard for that. Um, the other thing that we talk about that you heard a lot was the, those skills. Um, it's very important, and we put a lot of time into it, and in our surveys it shows that, that people are very appreciative of that, that we try to balance uh, the four skills, which are kind of like the really tools that you need in order to be, uh, uh, be able to, su to survive in any culture, you know, linguistically. But also the other aspect that people sometimes don't really give a lot of credit is culture. You need to know the culture very well. Because you may know all the language components, but when you get into a culture, if you don't know how to fit in, to understand that in some cultures, you know, people hug each other. They give you kisses, maybe four kisses instead of uh, one kiss. You know, those things are very important, so you don't feel awkward and you know how to behave. Certain gestures, you know, that you might be acceptable in our culture in the U.S., uh, perhaps are not acceptable in other countries. So we, that's very important. So we work very hard not only to address the, the, the four skills, but also to, we call it the fifth skill, to be honest with you, which is that culture. We've been putting a lot of work with, that we've been doing, actually, a lot of our PD, which is kind of revamp our culture. Um, up until recently, our culture was very much intro introduced and presented in a very uh, isolated way. Um, now we're kind of, you know, obviously, languages like French, German, they are already ahead of, for example, in this case, Spanish. Um, they've been able to embed that culture in all that they do in the classroom. We are doing that now. We're, we're revamping our culture component of our curriculum. Try to make it part of our of our units, part of what we teach on a daily basis. Versus, you know, stop and let's talk about, um, believe it or not, uh, uh, the blue. Uh, angels um, ambulances that there were in some country that made no sense was so very isolated and disconnected um, so we felt the need for that so we've been working a lot on that because we do believe that culture is really an important component of language learning obviously um, as uh, uh, Madame Ocon presented at the beginning when she talked about curriculum she presented that chart to you very well um, you know the five C's that she mentioned they kind of are like our, our Bible. We follow that. Those are the important guidelines for us. Everything that we do in the classroom and out of the classroom in preparation for what we do uh, uh, for instruction and student learning kind of centers around those five C's. They are definitely connected to the state and national standards. Um, one of the things that uh, COVID kind of brought to us, which is, was really nice, we were able to kind of uh, research and try to find some online platforms that are now embedded into our instruction and kids really love that and why do they love it you know uh, number one as maybe more exciting for some of them to really learn the language you know uh, learning does not have to be painful it can be fun it's okay to be fun you know so they they enjoy that 
Um, also what it does is, as some of our teachers uh, presented before, allows us to kind of in individualize instruction a little bit. You know, where kids can kind of go through the learning pro process at their own pace on the need basis uh, uh, as well. So some of these plat platforms are really uh, uh, very helpful to us. Uh, and obviously, exposes kids to a wide variety of aspects of language learning, different dialects. You know, so we really, COVID has been really beneficial to us because it really helped us uh, improve our plethora of, of tools that we can use in our instruction, which is helping improving student learning, which is, that's why we're here for. Um, obviously, the, the other component uh, uh, from all the surveys, the results also express the fact that really uh, people want us to expand our uh, world language program at the elementary schools. You know, uh, obviously they're very appreciative, and we are very appreciative that the town has really made a huge sacrifice for us to be able to offer that in sixth grade. But like with everything, we would love to expand that. And we're counting on you to kind of be the, uh, the force for that to happen, hopefully, uh, in the years ahead. I know times are not, are not that easy nowadays, but hopefully uh, things will change and we'll be able to rectify that uh, uh, in the future. Um, we're always looking for ways to have like common prep times, you know, that was one of the, one of the things that came out out of, the, uh, out of the surveys. For example, at DOD, we actually have our world language teachers have a common prep time, and that's extremely valuable. And that's almost hard to find, to be honest with you, where all the world languages teachers are together and have a common time where they can kind of meet. Because like I said, I said before, we don't just work within our own language. We kind of uh, uh, go across into other languages. Uh, we share ideas. We want our kids, like I said before, to have common experiences. Um, not only just within the year one or the year two uh, of French, but also in all the languages. So that, that aspect is really important. So we're always looking for, at the high school they've worked really hard also to try to kind of facilitate that. Uh, which has been very helpful. Uh, I know uh, Dr. Reed uh, with a schedule. Uh, I don't know how she keeps on smiling, but it's quite difficult to try to find. But we, they do try. We're trying to find ways to where we can get the most uh, 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 or as many of our teachers uh, together as possible. Uh, we do obviously do through, through, through PLC groups. We allow them, we put them together in certain organize in certain ways and try to kind of compensate that way, uh, but it would be nice to have additional time. Um, and in the end, just to end, uh, obviously the uh, results were um, uh, overwhelmingly positive about what we do um, in the classroom. Okay. Our kids are happy, our, our parents are happy, our teachers are happy. Obviously, is it perfect? No, it's not. Uh, right, is, is there room for improvement? Yes, it is. That's why we kind of believe that the curriculum is never written in stone. You know, things are there to be changed, to make it better, and it's okay to change. So, that's basically it to kind of give you a little uh, quick overview of, of, of our work, of our study, a five-year study. Um, we'll gladly answer any questions you might have, or even follow-up questions that you might have. We'll, we'll get back to you if need be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for being here. Tonight. Appreciate it. You're yeah. no problem. You are. I just want to say I see the passion in every single one of you. You're all excited to talk about this. I see the dedication. It's so refreshing. I'm not surprised how students are really uh, taking to the languages. I, I got a lot of points out of this today. In some ways, uh, it's, so I've been on the board for way too long. <laughs> 14, 13, whatever, 14 years. And I remember several years ago, we were talking about expanding world languages, you know, early on every year. I think the goal about seven years ago was to try to expand it to uh, another grade level each year. I don't know why that hasn't materialized beyond six, sixth grade, but it's probably part of it. But I am certainly open to the idea, and I would say this, with the school modernization, um, Phase one of the two new large elementary schools. Uh, hope that passes referendum this year because we're going to need the space. But there's an opportunity, in my opinion, when those schools are designed um, because they're elementary level. If there could be a model world language lab for elementary schools, I would certainly support those schools and think ahead about doing something similar 
to the rest of the elementary schools as they have to be renovated over time. So you can, we can think near term that way. So I, I'm kind of curious, besides the physical plan to make this work, what else do you need to expand? And I would say to the fifth grade. Is it more professionals like yourselves? Obviously, more time to collaborate, collaborate. dedicated, uninterrupted collaboration time. Got it. <laughs> yeah. But like, how, how do you envision? How do you see this expanding yeah. beyond the sixth grade? Where would you go next? Obviously, the manpower would be important. Of course, in this situation, just because of the amount of students that we we work with. Um, so uh, I think, for example, if we were to move to another another grade, I think the addition of another teacher uh, would suffice uh, to do that. Um, uh, yeah, at least at least one teacher. I think we should be able to. Obviously, depends also, you know, what do you want to do with it? You know, um, how much time do you have available for kids to learn the language? The more the better. But we also realistic. And we know that uh, there are other subject matters that students need to learn. But I think with one teacher, we should be able to uh, expand and, and give our students a great experience, which believe that, that in turn, by the time they will be able to, by the time they graduate high school, be at a higher level of proficiency, because we will be able to further their learning of the language. So, um, you know, our kids already do very well uh, on, on, on the uh, standardized testing. Uh, in, in, in languages, if they start even early, they will do even better. They will achieve at even higher levels of proficiency. So I would say one teacher would would suffice uh, to for us to be able to at least um, bring it down to uh, fifth grade. Just one? Yeah. <laughs> it seems yeah. like a big load to put on one person. Yeah, because I mean, our teacher right now we have one teacher that teaches all the sixth graders. Okay. Um, it is a it is a huge load when it comes to to. Um, to the amount of students that she works with. Yeah. Yeah. But it What's is our fifth grade one? Strong. All around three hundred. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So three hundred students. Yeah. <clears throat> like do you have a budget estimate of what it takes to add a language? I mean, yeah, we actually do you, have that. that I, I can I, I, Yeah, I we can we can share I can find that and send it to you so you'll have it because we have that from the study that we did from the uh, uh, World Language Committee that was put together and uh, Ms. Juliana was, uh, was part of it. Uh, so that kind of breaks down the different approaches of how to go about it and uh, the cost of each uh, additional year. Yeah, we do have that. Along with a breakdown of how the expenses Correct. would be allocated, you know, versus yeah, we have personnel, like, materials, personnel, instruction, uh, all of that. Yeah. We, we have that already on paper. Yeah. I would gladly share that with you. Yeah, I would obviously get it from Arlene as well. We want to bypass. Of course. I, actually, she has it. But <laughs> she no, was no. an intricate member of that committee as well, so she's well familiar. The other reason why I said too is because uh, this board's been something a little different. Normally, it, it just, you know, been old habits, sometimes old habits are hard to break. The, the boards usually don't talk about. Um, we always talk about needs, must-haves, right? Then there's the wants, right? I, uh, there's folks that think this is a want, they think it's a need, but we usually don't get into that until January, after the budget's been, you know, uh, drafted, and and at that point in time, it, it always seems like these advancements are put on the back burner for a year or so, and then sometimes board members have a new idea, and it comes up in January, and it's too late to even think about. It. So this time we're actually looking ahead, and the finance committee. I think there's a meeting. Yeah, yeah uh, uh, June. June. Of these things to move the needle forward, this could be one of them. So if, if you can get those costs, and at least we can the board can talk about it ahead of time and, and be prepared for it. Versus we're always saying it's not a new problem. This is more of a. So I, I think the fine folks are very receptive. But I do. I, I can't articulate it well. But I, I believe there's an opportunity with the new schools at the very least, to at least look at the structure or something like this. And because um, while we're focused on the first two schools, uh, it, every school's got to be touched at some point through three phases. And it would be nice to model, if we need a language lab in elementary schools, what that would look like. Um, but my guess is even with the virtual labs, that would be a huge aid to the teacher, uh, getting out to the grade, is that something going. 
Yeah, because one of the great pluses we've gotten, we've got a lot of accommodations for, for our language life at the high school. It's been really, really helpful. Yeah. And we saw that on, on the student performance as well. You know, their level of speaking uh, improved tremendously from, from the time that we started to use the lab. Uh, because it does allow kids to, to kind of, in, in not feeling so uh, awkward if, in front of their classmates to kind of speak and uh, apply what they learn in the class. Um, and the lab has so many uh, resources, allows us to put them uh, engaged in conversations with peers, uh, listen to authentic things. There's so much that it's really extremely beneficial. Um, we are now looking and trying, you know, based on the results of the survey, there's a need for it to really kind of bring that to the middle school. Um, I'm in the process of kind of setting up a, a, uh, a meeting with a company to kind of uh, show us what's out there virtual. I think the way to go for the future is definitely the virtual labs, uh, just because that gives a little bit more flexibility. Uh, schools don't have a lot of space uh, to kind of uh, allocate to a language lab, so a lot of a lot of a lot of high schools and, and districts are now going to the virtual language labs, which have gotten better. We pilot. We actually many years ago we pilot that that uh, the, the first initial language, virtual language labs uh, at Dodd. Uh, and since then, things have improved and they're much better. So we're going to be looking into that for That's Dodd, right. uh, definitely. But we do have the plan that will uh, actually, part of the study that we did for oral languages, it had a, a many uh, ways of uh, phasing in uh, the language program into the uh, elementary level. So our tour, let's just say that we were um, lucky enough mm -hmm. to get an additional mm -hmm. language teacher. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing that you would use that in the fifth grade to teach another year of Spanish? That would be fantastic. Or would you use it to have additional days at Dodd in a language? How about both? It's like, who's your favorite child? Really? <laughs> you know, okay. Okay. Thanks, I, I'm, I'm having twins. I'm having twins. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm just, I'm just yeah, curious I, I, that, that I'm, world language task yeah. was quite a few years ago. Correct. You know, and, you know, it, it's going to be a perfect it's going to be you know, yeah. $80,000 yeah. to, to really do some of this. Yeah. We're talking about the lab. Um, and would you bypass the middle school to do, and I guess what you're saying, Tony, is we wouldn't be bypassing it, we would just be saying we have an opportunity at the elementary, everything will be updated eventually in the phase two or phase three. So the well, focus might be at the elementary for an, our opportunity for a, some type of lab yeah. simulation. I would love to, to be honest with you, I think, I think as a number one priority, I would go for the expansion to fifth grade with the teacher. Uh, I think everything else can come afterwards. Um, even the seventh grade you were asking, I probably would prefer to have a fifth grade teacher than have uh, Spanish every day at Dodd, um, or even, to be honest with you, even a language lab at Dodd versus having a fifth grade uh, teacher. I would much rather have the fifth grade teacher. Um, what did that do for your curriculum? Because now you're, yeah, you're having to course. rewrite, I would think, at a faster pace Correct. because you've taught things earlier. Correct. So what you now learned in sixth, you're learning in fifth. So sixth grade curriculum has to change. Correct. When those kids go up seventh grade curriculum has to change. It it all, it, it's going to follow yeah. it all the way. So that, that's... And that was also part of the cost uh, because obviously we need to write that curriculum. We need to kind of be ahead of the kids as they move on. Mm -hmm. Not only we have to create, because we need to create the fifth grade curriculum, but we have to adjust the other curriculum. The, the greatest thing about it is that eventually by the end of the language studies, kids will be at a further point in the language acquisition and proficiency level. You know, um, we're talking about at a, you know, in, in languages there's, there's different levels of proficiency and, and the ultimate is advanced. Um, Right now, our kids are kind of in the intermediate uh, high, kind of. I think if we were able to get them exposed at early stages, we could advance some of these kids into uh, an advanced level of proficiency, which is a, a, an above work uh, ability of, of the language. He's, he's so, if I might add, yes, um, I also think that it could help with retention because there are 
a number of factors. I mentioned social and emotional learning components earlier, but I really, especially in light of COVID, I have seen how much the need to address uh, social and emotional issues has, has become. It has grown exponentially. It has changed how I've been teaching. I know it has changed how a lot of my colleagues are teaching. And one of the things I think we're up against, as I uh, hinted to earlier, is that when kids are first exposed to a language during puberty, it's not just about which parts of their brains have shut down. It's about the fear of being ridiculed against their, you know, in the midst of their peers. And if we were able to start them on a language in fifth grade, many of them haven't, haven't quite succumbed to the, the peer pressures of puberty yet. If we could inculcate them in the belief that world language is wonderful, it will help them, it is beneficial, it's not something that's just a side dish, it is integral to what they do, then by the time they're in seventh grade, maybe it won't feel so weird. Maybe it won't feel so scary. And then, because they will have already had so many years of exposure and practice under their belts, even if as freshmen they aren't super fluent, because it takes a long time to get really fluent, but it, it offers them an opportunity to be at a higher level when they get to junior and senior year, which for courses like our ECE courses, which are Yukon Early Experience courses, maybe we could hang on to some who right now don't believe themselves capable or worthy of taking that class because it feels too unattainable. So if we could get them started earlier, maybe more of those kids would hang on and take the college level class. Right now those numbers are, are frighteningly small in my opinion, and I would love to make them bigger. I'm with you a little bias of my daughter, uh, graduate two years of Cheshire High School, she ended up taking French. And, uh, you know, in hindsight, she always wished that was able to start earlier. Mm -hmm. So by the time she got a junior senior year, and, um, and I'm, I'm a big proponent of you know, starting earlier, you know, where you can't make sense. And so I, I'm with you on that. Um, so I, I mean, I'm sure, I know the rest of the board is also receptive to a lot of this. It's just we haven't really seen, again, the last two years have been less than, um, optimal to, to get things in. We're starting to come out of this spot from this pandemic, and uh, I think it feeds even fades out of our budget discussions that we need to kind of move the real education forward, right? And doesn't fix costs more in our, in our core education. So definitely open to this. I have another, another question. Um, it may not be relevant. If it isn't, just let me know. How how about English learners? How does that Fit into this because really for them that's English is a, it's a new language. Right? Is, it, is that done outside of the yeah? Sorry. Yeah. You're talking about the ESL. 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 Yeah, I'm sorry. ESL. ESL. Yeah. ESL. Um, ESL. Yeah, I mean it, it, that aspect of the curriculum is not part of our world language sure. program, um, so I can really that's okay. uh, expand on that. Um, I mean we do have Frau House actually. Um, she has a little bit of knowledge when it comes to uh, ESL. Uh, she's actually mentoring uh, our uh, ESL teacher. ESL teacher. Mm -hmm. So she might be more familiar with that than I am. We actually um, have a presentation on it coming up later. Yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, obviously languages, one of the things studies show is that when you, it, it is much easier to acquire other languages when you have already knowledge of, of, of a second or a first language. Uh, I mean, with our ESL, a lot of times we do have students, um, for example, native speakers of Spanish, that we put them in our classes of Spanish uh, as a way for them not only to, it gives, you, gives them a certain level of comfortability sure. in the school, but also is a way for them to really learn some of the grammatical components of, of English, because a lot of times when we are uh, explaining some of the linguistic, uh, linguistic aspects of our languages, we kind of start by explaining them in English sometimes uh, because many times, believe it or not, our students you know, uh, know English but sometimes if we ask them a certain specific question they don't know the answer so we have to kind of explain that. So a lot of the ESL students benefit from that, from that learning in our language classes uh, so it serves a dual purpose for them. One of them for them to kind of uh, feel good about themselves getting used to the school and at the same time 
being exposed to a little bit of uh, of the uh, language uh, learning process. Um, I'm just curious. So I should know this. I'm sure. How many times a week do the seventh graders meet? Every other day. Every other day. Yeah. Okay. And how long are their classes? Their classes are 40, 44, right? 44. Yeah. So if you went five days per week, would you still keep them at 44, 45 minutes, or would you would do that schedule? Yeah. 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 That would yeah. be. You would stay, have to yeah. stay the same. Okay. Um, yeah, I should think that if you were to, if you had to make the trade-off, you know, I should think if you were introducing the language in fifth grade, they, you've said this already, they would be that much further along. So if you didn't get that five day per week, so that it, it wouldn't um, perhaps be as... as uh, and, yeah, and the benefit is the exposure to a younger age. Yeah, yeah, That's no, I understand that. Yeah. Um, with COVID, did you, have you seen didn't sound like it, but any measurable learning loss? Because it sounds like that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we just said how you know you were, the technology and yeah, everything um, really kind of was a, a um, boom to yeah uh, a little bit, a little bit, uh, because uh, nothing beats the the, the in person uh, instruction. Mm -hmm. You know, um, one of the things that you know you if you go if you have a chance to go through the presentation is that. We are now kind of going through this stage where um, technology is great, but maybe is it too much mm -hmm. that really hinders a lot of the learning process. We, we struggle a lot of times with students perhaps using a little bit too much of technology when doing that work in world language. Um, so yeah, when they were at home, uh, I think it was very difficult for us to kind of keep tabs on the learning process. Uh, so yeah, we did see a little bit of a decline in the in the abil overall abil ability level of the students, uh, but this is something that we've been working the past few years that we've been able to kind of catch up, and uh, uh, we foresee that within another year or so we should be at the levels that we were prior uh, pandemic. You know, with acceleration, we'd be able to kind of compensate for some of, uh, not even compensate, just kind of move them along a little bit better. Um, and uh, students are now uh, starting to produce at the level that we were used to. And was it in a particular uh, area? So either in... Oh, I'll check. Go ahead. It is not for our lack of trying. No, I'm not. Yeah. I know. Yeah. What, I, what I saw happen, and, and we have had these conversations many Correct. times, many of us went above and beyond to adapt to the new reality in which we were living um, and do so on the fly because we didn't want to lose ground with our kids. Mm -hmm. Everything that we do, in addition to all the passion that you saw here, the simple fact of the matter is our subject area is of a nature that is entirely cumulative. Mm -hmm. So if we lose ground, especially for us because we are the only full-time teachers at the high school in our respective languages, if we lose ground, it just comes back to hurt us. Right. So we really dug in and used those online sources and created and created and created and created documents and used Google Classroom and made as many resources possible as we could. Mm -hmm. That does not mean that every student availed him right. or herself of those resources. And sadly, because we weren't able to see them all on their cameras all the time for every remote session, we came to the conclusion, sadly, that some of them were not focusing as much as they would have or could have or should have were we in an in-person setting. So what we've seen is not an across-the-board loss, because some students, God bless them, are just intrinsically motivated and want to do their best all the time. So some kids, even though they were full-time remote or part-time remote, and we adapted you know, to changes based on who was sick, and who was home, and who was in. Mm. I think we really did everything we possibly could to maintain our same standard and our same expectation and complete the same amount of curriculum. And we dug in and did our very best at that. Some students did the same, and yeah. some not. And I think part of that goes back to the social-emotional stuff, too. We had some kids who just fell apart when they were home, 
and it was a struggle just to keep them in a healthy, emotionally more or less balanced place, and academics became secondary. And we tried to adapt with them as best we could, too. Yeah. And then as Mr. Bronco has articulated in the time since, we've tried to catch everybody up as best we can, extra help sessions, more resources online. Um, you know, we, we've done everything well, so, you we know, can. You know, we've, and not just schools, but you know, the entire Life. country, even yeah. employers that throw Zoom and mm -hmm. Teams all of a sudden out with everyone. Mm -hmm. So it's not as if the kids were spending an hour or two a day just on Zoom language. It was the entire day. Yes. Yes. So that, so you know, that was working a bit against you yeah. too. Yeah. Um, but I, again, I, I can tell you, as, as you all know, um, very much a you know, obviously global economy. I, I can't tell you in my profession every day, every team I work with, uh, if they're not Canada, they're in Italy, if not Italy, they're in Spain, um, Asia, Ireland, Vietnam. It, it's, it's just, and what's interesting is the common language is English, right? I, and there, and there's, I wish I learned Spanish better. Uh, I'm, as far as I'm still learning English at this age because when I, I remember my first day of kindergarten, I couldn't speak English. All I knew was Italian. And uh, so I appreciate the fact that this is out there now, but um, you know, our kids are graduating to a you know, very diverse culture, and the business in particular uh, is all over the place. And it, it'll be nice to be able to speak some of those languages and, and, and build that credibility, appreciate culture. So uh, you know, I honestly fully support this. I wish I had a money trick to keep shaking and getting more and more every year. But you know, like anything else in my curriculum, if we're not chipping away at every year, we're going to get there. So I, I think there's opportunity to hopefully expand this. Yeah. No, I think we should look at it. And, you know, let's get the budget now yeah. and not uh, December or even November. I mean, the earlier we get it, you know, my, my big concern I've always, uh, I've been touting this one for a while, is just how limited our instructional ex expenses are, or, or, you know, that instructional element of the budget is. And and how do we finesse that? Um, I think mean, that's, it's possible, but I think, you know, we can't do it in a five-day period in January. we got to know in advance how, what we're looking at and then where we find the, the monies. And, um, so, um, let's, yeah, I, let's just pile more work on you, huh? Yeah, so, yeah. Well, it's like we have it. It's written, so yeah, it's, yeah, not, yeah. it's not that bad. It's not that bad. But so. One thing that really struck me is you just, you know, it's, um, the fact that the kids are actually asking for hard copy materials. Yeah. With, and I, you know, Way back when um, I studied French, which was just after French was discovered, I think. <laughs> but um, you know, they, we had to read uh, Victor Hugo or something. I read um, Candide, I think, or something. And um, you know, it was just what you see on the page, the written page, is never what you're hearing and what you're seeing. We have textbooks, but um, so I applaud these kids for saying, "Hey, you know, yeah. um, let's get something in hand," and, and whether it's newspaper articles or or uh, actual novels, or um, and I know that there are folks who say the same thing even in our um, language arts program. You know, they just the, the the beauty of having something. Correct. I mean, I yeah, just like in my especially my Latin three class. It's probably, I mean, AP is its own beast, but like it's the most difficult. It's the most work. <coughs> the most grammar. Like it's yeah. hard grammar. It's the end of their grammar, and then turns into kind of like a lit class and a different language, right. I'm like what is happening? But um, like I have did, someone for some master's program made a beautiful resource online and uploaded so many of the materials that we actually use and it's online and it's a clickable running text so they can use the dictionary if they need it. But I still get, I'm, I give it to them like, you know, you can use this, but then I still have kids who are like, do you have a book? I'm like, absolutely, here you go. It's from like 1950 because the language really changed that much. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they just prefer it, and you know, or they'll have both going at the same time. They'll look in the right. at the actual yeah. text yeah. and have the yeah. the online because it's just easier to find the vocab, and it's just right. I mean, but even to be able to you know to write the vocab and the oh, margins yeah. and have yeah, it there, just writing, right. makes just it writing, and that's why you learn better. Yeah. Yeah. And the tactile memory aspect on that, right. yeah. yeah, and it's really a, a, an amazing light bulb moment and. Uh, proud mama, proud teacher moment when you have kids who are all about being on the computer all the time. They're like, no, I really learn it better when I write it out. Yeah. And yeah. that, like, that's 
the best part of teaching because we're teaching them how to learn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not just teaching them our content, but we're getting them to be aware of their own learning process as right. they go, right. and how sometimes old-fashioned stuff, you know, it's good for a reason. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's good. Um, and then the institute. How many did you have, and what do you last year, and what do you expect? Well, I guess you're finite yeah. number of teachers, yeah. but. Um, how many do you think are going to be participating missions? So we had we had uh, three of us that participated. Okay. So my goal is to kind of have all the other languages as well exposed to that. So once again, we want us to be on the same page. So this year we have three new languages going there. So we'll have Latin, we'll have Italian, and we have German. Uh, they'll be part of it. Um, because I think the, what we've learned there is important, is vital for what we do. Um, that I think the, the more of us that are more familiar with the aspects that were presented at the workshop, the better it will be for us when it comes to common, uh, commonality, uh, consistency, you know, all the things that we do in, in our department. So we're going to have the other, the other three languages go and then hopefully the following year we'll have, we'll expect it to have some of our middle school uh, uh, colleagues as well. Uh, but that's what, uh, what we have in plan right now. Um, all right, and then just finally, um, you were asking for a full day PD. Uh, how many do you now have, and what do you think your needs are? They have two now. Correct. Yeah. Fall and spring. 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 And so you want a winter? I mean, is it picking up a You know, it's, it's one of those things. That you, I don't think you'll find a teacher that will ever tell you, oh, I have enough PD. I'm so sick of PD. I can't stand it anymore. I mean, we want more, obviously. Uh, we understand that there are some restrictions and certain aspects that really uh, don't allow us to have as many as we want. We just find those. We just wanted, like, through our findings, people find those full-day PDs to be the most rewarding and the ones that we're able to produce the most. Well, it's departmental. And yeah. Because, yeah, that was my next thing, because it brings us, puts us together, you know, 6 through 12. Mm -hmm. uh, not only allows us to be within languages, but also sometimes together as a department. You know, the sharing that we talk about uh, between what's happening in German, what they do, and share with, maybe we can borrow that and use it in Spanish and so on. Those days are vital for that. Uh, the other days too, I mean obviously the half days are very helpful, uh, allow us within the building to do certain things. Uh, um, you know, even the, the, uh, the Wednesday, the Wednesdays is, you know, that, that hour at the end of the day. Um, obviously it's hard to kind of make big production, to produce huge things on those times. Just because by the time you settle in, by the time you really put your thoughts together, uh, it's over, you know. But mm -hmm. We do, we do. That's why I was saying before, I think we also need to learn how to maximize that better, you know, as a department and try to find a way to really get the most out of those, out of those days. Uh, we work hard to try to kind of uh, do what we need to do, uh, but obviously the full days, uh, anyone, any teacher will tell you are probably the best, period. Thanks. I'm done. Uh, Thank you. You're Thank you. Yeah, this was Appreciate nice. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you so much for listening. And uh, yeah. we'll definitely, uh, you know, through Marlene, we'll yeah. pass that sure. on to you. The um, the budgets that we had, in, uh, that we came up with on our task force for world languages many years ago. So you can look at it and see how that would implement nowadays. That'd be great. Okay. Good. Thanks. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Should we? We should. We just say happy birthday to you. Oh, 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 you had to do that, did you? Yeah, so far as you can be quiet. Happy birthday to you. 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 Thank you. Oh, yeah, you did. Thank you. You're very good at it. <laughs> Our department really functions like a family. I know. Trust me. Trust me. Happy birthday. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us, and I appreciate we're, your time. We're hitting, we're hitting all the meeting nights. People's birthday, uh, Cinco de Mayo. Yeah. Yeah. Valentine's, yeah. Valentine's, Valentine's wow. Day. And St. Patrick's Day. We hit them all this year. We hit them all this year. <laughs>
Wow. Well, then make sure Thank that you. you all get like one big massive party day with your intimate people <laughs> yeah. at the yeah. end. Yeah. Just like margarita bowl and then all like there you go. Yeah. Invite all the spouses <laughs> and significant <laughs> others and children. Just do it up here. All all right. Right. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Bye. Have a great Bye. one. Thank you for the time. Bye. 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 Next up, we are going to discuss the LASB's assessment. Last night, so we'll stay with language acquisition, actually. First time acquisition of English. So, as I think we've shared with you previously, all of our English learners, um, and take this as a moment to say, we'll, we'll probably be changing our vocabulary on this over time to multilingual learners. Um, just this is, it's an asset to be able to be proficient in more than one language, so the, that language around multilingual learning is, kind of connotes that. So, um, but our, uh, the state assessment for all of our students who are identified as English learners or multilingual learners um, happens in January, February, March of each year. It's called the last month's assessment. And not unlike what you heard from the World Language Department, we focus in on reading, writing, listening, and speaking. Um, so all of the students take um, uh, this assessment in four sections, one section for each of those. And um, they get a score range of one through five. And I'll use the language descriptors for that um, because it really, although we say it's levels, it really almost is stages of language development. So a one is considered beginning. A two is early or intermediate, a three is intermediate, four is proficient, and five um, is advanced. So this year, um, and for this assessment, individual students get um, those indications, those proficiency levels for each of the areas, reading, writing, listening, and speaking. Mm -hmm. And then a combined oral proficiency, which is listening and speaking together, combined literacy proficiency, which is reading and writing together, and then overall. So that's why you see some combination of those categories there. This year we um, assessed 101 English learners. The last time we gave this report, which was two years ago, um, last year's was a little bit different. We did do this assessment, but um, we didn't do this report because of the different modes of, mm -hmm. of assessment. Uh, there were 51 students on the report two years ago, so we truly have doubled the number of English learners in the last couple of years. And you can see the proficiency levels broken down there, um, ranging from beginner all the way up through proficient. You notice that we don't have any students in advance, and that's not atypical because once students meet a um, proficient level overall in reading and writing, they are exited from sure. English learners. So. It would be a student who moved up two levels in one year from intermediate all the way up to advanced. So sometimes you'll see numbers in that level five advanced category, but not often. Um, because those do represent stages, um, it's often hard to, using that information, to say how our instruction is doing because what we don't have control is the level of English proficiency a student may have coming into the school year. Mm -hmm. So if we happen to have a year with a lot of newcomers, you'll see a lot more students in the beginning or early mm -hmm. intermediate stages. So that's why that second table gives us a little bit um, better indication of how our program is supportive mm -hmm. of um, English language development because this indicates the kind of growth that students have had from year to year. So we can see um, whether they have, on a scale score basis, increased the number of scale score points in each of those categories from year to year. And you can see that the overwhelming majority of our students have moved up at least some scale score points each year. Um, and then a smaller number of students um, are making full band levels of growth, so moving from early intermediate to intermediate or intermediate to proficient on that front. So that gives us a relatively good indication of the kind of growth that students are making from year to year. I view this largely as um, positive growth, both in the percent of points gained and also band growth. Um, it's, it's an indication that students are, are moving along pretty well. Of course, the higher the numbers in any year, the better off we're going to be. Uh, 
but this indicates some noticeable growth for our students on the whole uh, who are identified as English learners right now. The state does set, um, is, has a target to have our English learners become proficient within five years. So what's not quite evident on this report is exactly how many um, scale points a student needs to make on a year. So this indicates that students make growth, but this particular report doesn't say how much growth mm -hmm. they're making towards kind of becoming proficient over that five year time period. We'll get a little bit more feedback on that information as we go into the fall, because these reports just came to us quite recently. So this is information we're really looking from that. The uh, individual families received a home report, and those got mailed out on Friday of last week. So families probably received them Saturday, today, or tomorrow at the latest. And that um, gives not only uh, the students' proficiency levels, but it's also an indication from us whether they would continue for EL support here um, next year or whether they exited from the program. So this just gives a, a quick snapshot of that state assessment and the proficiency levels for we talked about this in the past. Uh, so I see our students getting the support, but what about support for families at home, mm -hmm. parents that maybe need some resources to that? Is that yeah. through adult education classes? Yeah. 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 And and um, you know, I'll give you just a small example of some of the things that Ryan Murphy's been able to do. So you know that we use Parent Square this year, yes. this communication tool. It's got a natural translation feature built into that. So we were feeling pretty good about having that um, as a tool. Well, when we did a little bit of digging, and Ryan did a little bit of digging early on the year, we realized maybe three families were actually using that. Mm -hmm. So Ryan was able to connect the dots with the families who indicated that they had wanted um, some translation support and help make sure that they can enable that feature and knew that feature was there when we're not sure from it. So um, there are the supports like adult ed, and there's also these smaller things that we're tuning into more and more that we can do to make sure that our, our families are well connected. And so are we seeing the same thing in terms of participation with parents and adult ed? In the, it's there, but not as many parents are availing themselves of it. So we can't assume that not every parent of an English learner isn't multilingual. Sure. Right. So there's that piece of it. Right. Um, we also, you know, depending on, um, well, depend, depending upon a lot of things, but we certainly have quite a few families whose, whose the parents are participating through adult ed. Okay. If they can't participate here because of whatever the timing, sure. we're also able to refer them to other local mm -hmm. adult ed programs. Mm -hmm. And then looking at the differences between the elementary and the secondary, and I'm just looking at overall proficiency. You know, there's it, clearly the secondary level is does not perform as high as the elementary. Is that because? We've got siblings in programs, and they're coming in later in their language development. Um, and we've got you know these little kids coming in, and you know they pick it up like this. I mean, is, what what what's what do you think's happening here? Fifth. There's um, there's if you remember back to the fall, we shared a little bit about the numbers. First of all, there's a lot more. <laughs> elementary right. and the typical grade level where students kind of test out as fourth and fifth grade for a lot of the reasons that you're just um, that you're just indicating. Mm -hmm. So if a student has been um, immersed in English instruction um, for a number of years, um, it is often the case that they'll develop proficiency and mm -hmm. test out on that front. Um, sometimes students have five or six other things going on as well. Sure. Maybe. So this doesn't filter out, filter out any of those things. Uh, additionally, what this, what these numbers won't show is whether a student's a newcomer or not a newcomer on, right. on that front. So it's a little bit hard to, to parse out on that front. Um, in this particular year, we're really only talking eight students at the oh. secondary level. Okay. So those percentages may be a little bit skewed. Okay. 
Is there anything else you wanted to add? I should have added that you wanted to. I, I, I'll just reiterate something we shared with Paul. You know, we um, have been very proactive about making sure our programming is, is solid. We will end this year with three TESOL certified teachers, one in each grade level band, elementary, middle, and high school, which is not a level of expertise that we've had um, here before. So um, we are very mindful of the fact that this is a growing population. We need a level of expertise here for all of our teachers to help support uh, and yeah. development. I think we're, we've been good about being proactive in, in doing, um, in doing that. So I'll just add that to, to Okay, me. so since you've added that, what, what strikes me is that we did not, this is our first year with having three instructors. Two are, two are uh, will be certified by the energy. So, uh, I guess I, I, you know, asked about learning loss and kids falling behind. This it must have truly impacted this, um, this student cohort. I, I would think. I mean, you know, they. I'm gonna say it depends. Um, okay. But if if um, students acquire people acquire a language by being immersed in the language, so where the pandemic did not allow students to be immersed in English as much, their English development is probably, the English proficiency growth is probably not as strong. So that could be a few things. That could be um, being remote for learning and um, not being as immersed as much of the day uh, in, in a rich language environment where you can get all the nonverbal cues as well right. <laughs> that are going to help with your language acquisition. Um, too early on uh, in the pandemic with people being a little bit less social, right? Um, right? Keeping, for safety reasons, keeping to themselves. So where that was a situation for families, there is a good chance that their English development did not move as long as much as it would have otherwise. So, but it's a, it depends on that. Okay. Thanks. Okay, last but not least. Um, that's just the, uh, well, all the materials are there, and mm -hmm. those are the books that we would go for. So these are um, for a dual enrollment course, mm -hmm. and um, the uh, Tungsis is actually paying for it the first year. Yeah, it's always good to say. That is good. No, that's the thing. Yeah. Um, but beyond that, we'll have to pick up. You know, somehow. Well, it's also college credit, too, right? Yeah. And so yeah. It's, it's, it's great. Yeah. So these are the materials that they're putting forward. And actually, Texas is requiring us to use the materials. Is it part of a textbook? Is there any the digital content that goes along with it? Or is it um, there is there is a digital piece with it, too. But it's not completely yeah. digital. No. No, okay. there's this. Yeah. So I'm just, um, associated with the county too. Yes. I was going to say, is it what level of financial? Is it kind of a generic? Is it? I remember in my yeah. high school days, it was like level one and two, and this is level two. This is deep within. Okay. You know, they take one year for accounting one, and then they go. Okay. So um, um, there is a so there's a another. Component cost, which I assume with the one thirty one fifty, where you're looking at this sheet. Yeah. So that's the pricing. Yes. That we would not have to pay in the first year because taxes would pay for that. But it's important to know that that will be added to our budget going forward. But this is the. So would we buy whole sets, or would there be replacement materials going after this, or? Um, so we would buy a whole. On. We would buy a whole set. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think part of this issue was that they were using like a, a, a paper copy and we were trying to explain that that's not going to work for our students. Right. We need something that's more durable where your college kids buy most of their textbooks and then you go return them. You know, here we don't 
Yeah. We don't sell them afterwards. We need to reuse them over and over again. We need to make sure they weigh 50 pounds. <laughs> yes. And, and, yeah, it's, it, it wasn't. So I, I was driving by the high school last week. It had to be in the morning because I saw our kids crossing the park, the park and they're carrying these giant wow. backpacks. And you just see them, you know, trucking, you know, like they were, it, it was, they, they were yeah. troopers, they, you know, but they, I'm like, ah. Oh. So now my daughter's doing that with, with their backpacks to this day. But, um, although I do appreciate the park cover. Is there any additional cost to families participating? Because I remember when I, so and like, um, like you've gotten you yeah. paid for some of the credits for other courses, so this yeah. is great, huh? Okay, awesome. It's not about the money, it's about the nice yeah. that the value is definitely yeah. there. Yeah. So we have to move this. Yep, we would move this to the full board for approval. But in the meantime, we would not bring it to the board until it has gone out for public review. Okay, so there's no uh, action tonight. We would have action tonight to move it to the full board. Okay. But we will not put it on the agenda of the full board until after the uh, public review process. Okay. So the motion would be we move to bring financial accounting 18th edition. Do we go all the way through the publisher? By sure. By William Bettner. Williams, Bettner, and Crisello to the full board for review. Pending um, public Pending. review. Public review. Okay. Do I have a second? Okay. Um, I'll be, uh, okay. We're out there. That's great. All right. Well, um, I have nothing else on our agenda. So. I move to adjourn. All right. A second, and so we're good.